Thank you very much. Well, um, as Leonardo said, we were at the origin of these questions, and I think um, we think, with one exception, that the questions have been answered, and answered well, and answered, as um, Mr. Vasconcelos said, in a very structured way, which is a real help to us in, in reflecting on what we're doing, reflecting on the gaps in it, and reflecting on the way forward. So first reaction is very positive indeed to the, to the report. I should say I've read the policy brief. I haven't yet read the whole report. I look forward to doing that. So if I say something, um, you'll be able to say, oh, yeah, but the answer's in the full report, and um, <laughs> I won't be able to disclaim that. Um, I want to say a couple of things on factual points, a couple of things on the policy recommendations, and then end up with some issues about the way uh, forward as we're looking at it. So, um, in general, I recognised and, and, and would go along with the factual analysis in the report. Two issues I would raise. First, you estimate the cost of um, decarbonising the building stock at 600 to 1,800 billion euros by 2050, which seems to us to be a rather small amount relative to our estimate, which was something like two and a half trillion, so 2,500 2, billion. And I'll be interested to look closer at the figures that you came with, because if it can be done for only 600 billion, um, we have a sell. Um, <coughs> but I, I, I shall be generally interested. Um, secondly, I note, I know it's a kind of truism of en uh, energy efficiency policy, that there are things which make sense for the society which are not economical for the private individuals or the private businesses who are owning buildings. Um, this is an area I think we need to, and certainly I would like to understand better. Obviously, it's a function of the discount rate that you apply, because all of these investments have an upfront cost, and they bring you a saving in energy efficiency each year. So you can't simply say, as you can with... Uh, a power station project, perhaps, that this is or is not economical. It depends on what assumptions that you make or what discount factors you b build into the calculation. I wonder which discount factors you worked with, which you think it's appropriate to work with, whether you think that policy can change discount factors so that people are willing to make investments that have a longer payback time, whether maybe the success of energy efficiency in Germany is linked to the success of German industry, which is always seen from a British perspective to be a willingness of investors to accept a longer payback time, for example, and whether one can speak of an optimal discount factor. If an individual, if I have a particular payback time that I demand for my investments, if I'm not willing to do anything in my house, if it takes more than three years to pay for itself, can you call me a fool? Is that... Or can you just say that's a taste, just as if I choose to go to the cinema rather than the football, nobody's going to want to say that one of those choices is, 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 is a worse choice than another one. But is there anything normative we can say about discount factors? So I think that's an area where um, you slide over it slightly, but it's one that we certainly need to explore further. Um, that was on the factual side. On the policy side, again, I find your recommendations very good, very clear and very, very extremely well structured and it very much helps thinking things through point by point. You say in the policy brief that the first two recommendations, which are about getting the price right, are top priority. Not just happening to come first on the list or being preliminary, but top priority. Um, I certainly agree with that if we look at public policy as a whole, that getting the price right is what we ought to do before we intervene uh, more substantially in the market. But in this particular sector of energy efficiency in general and energy efficiency in buildings in particular, our feeling is that elasticities are very low, that price responsiveness is very low, that um, some work we saw suggested that um, uh, if you simply put the price up, as opposed to having a more sophisticated form of intervention, you have to spend nine times as much money in order to achieve the same number of energy efficiency improvements. So I wondered why that came out as the top two priorities, getting the price right. Um, then you made the point about an EU performance certification scheme. Um, the reason there is not one is because there is not a single way of describing the performance of buildings. That's also true when we regulate um, appliances. 
So there did not used to be a single way of describing the performances of air conditioners, but there is now because working with the standardisation bodies, we've made one. But the disparities in how national authorities measure the energy performance of buildings are much greater, and that's linked to the fact that there are climatic differences, there are cultural differences, there are some building types which only exist in certain countries, some building styles that only exist in certain countries. How important, we can potentially overcome this obstacle, but it will be hard work and it will mean squeezing the standardization bodies very much and for a very long time. How important do you really think it is for us to do that? Um, that was comment on the, on the policy recommendations. I was also, the one that was probably newest, and I think it comes from where you're coming from, was recommendation five, newest to us I mean, on the design of building refurbishment markets, and I think that's one that we will very much want to explore further. Then some remarks more generally on where, we get, where, where, where reports like this contribute to the policy development process that we're in. I'd highlight three areas. Um, the report rightly refers to the fact that we regulate the energy performance of appliances. It also mentions that European legislation requires member states to set minimum requirements for the energy performance of buildings when they're renovated. But both those pieces of legislation are quite kind of converging around building systems. Should we be, can we, should we not just be regulating the minimum efficiency of the light bulbs that a hotel could use, or the minimum energy consumption of that hotel when it undergoes major refurbishment, but should we also be regulating how much energy the lighting system of the hotel can use? Or is that an impossible intellectual challenge? So that's one of the things we're thinking of. Second area, um, the missing trade-off in the analysis from our point of view was the last one, which is how far should we go by making buildings more efficient, squeezing down their energy consumption, and how far should we go in introducing more zero carbon energy into the building, either through electricity, for example, heat pumps using carbon-free electricity, or through district heating using biomass or combined heat, uh, combined heat uh, and, or carbon capture and storage. So there is a trade-off we still have there, and that links to the question, is district heating just a transitional solution or is it a permanent solution? Um, my third point there would be, um, and it leads to what Mr. Vasconcelos said, um, how, what, if you look at the energy markets from an energy efficiency perspective, what would you want to see changing? What kind of price structures would you want to see? How do we make demand response function, which you were talking about? Um, how do we make energy efficiency obligations on utilities function in a way which is market friendly? So that's a whole set of debates that we also have that this report will bear on. One final point. It's true that this is the EU headquarters and it's got good performance, but this is our building, the Energy. <laughs> exactly. So uh, I'm ashamed to say that we too have some work to do. <laughs> I was trying to be exactly. polite.